If God would forgive me this time and let me off, I will leave this country the day after tomorrow. And be damned if I ever come into it again. John Coulter was born in 1774 near Stewart's Draft in Augusta County of the Colony of Virginia. The Coulters were Irish sharecroppers of the lower Shenandoah Valley. With the promise of cheaper land, the Coulters moved to Maysville, Kentucky in the mid-1780s. This town seat of Mays County is where John grew into adulthood. The records are sparse as to his early preoccupation, but the strapping portrait of this 5'10 Kentuckian and skill as a woodsman might lend credence to the rumor that he rode as a ranger under the command of the famed frontiersman, Simon Kenton. In August of 1803, John Coulter, along with his compatriots, George Shannon and Patrick Gass, approached Meriwether Lewis as the captain awaited the completion of his Corps of Discovery's river craft near Pittsburgh. The Corps of Discovery settled for the winter of 1803 to 1804, opposite the mouth of the Missouri River at Riviera du Bois, or Woods River. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark were away in St. Louis, securing last-minute supplies and receiving new information regarding the recent Louisiana Purchase. Sergeant John Ordway commanded the camp. During this time, a group of recruits, including Coulter, took to arguing with their regular army sergeant. The journal reads that Coulter, quote, loaded his gun to shoot Sergeant Ordway and disobeyed orders. This backwoods bravado was no doubt bolstered by liquor, or possibly the lack thereof. Captain William Clark had caught Coulter drunk on a couple instances in December. Upon hearing of this infraction, Lewis confined Coulter and the others to 10 days in base camp. After a review of the situation, Coulter was reinstated along with four other indicted men in the affair, after they offered apologies and promised to reform. During the expedition, John Coulter was considered to be one of the best hunters in the group, an able trailblazer and scout with a natural tracking ability. Usually under the direct orders of William Clark, Coulter was regularly sent out to scout the surrounding countryside for game, local Indian tribes, and to recover lost horses, especially during the expedition's later years. Captains Lewis and Clark record with regularity Coulter's coming and going in September of 1805 when the party crossed the Bitterroot Mountains in West Montana. At time of all-around sickness within the party, the perennially healthy Coulter hunted, trailblazed, and scouted for the expedition until they descended the Bitterroot Mountains, allowing access to the Snake River, Columbia River, and subsequently the Pacific Ocean. A significant portion of Coulter's time seems spent away from King. This is part of the reason why he never appears on the crew's sick list. In September 1805, while hunting far ahead of the main party, Coulter encountered three Tushapaw flatheads. The Journal of Captain Lewis reads, This evening, one of our hunters returned accompanied by three men of the Flathead Nation, whom he had met in his excursion up Traveler's Rest Creek. On first meeting him, the Indians were alarmed and prepared for battle with their bows and arrows. But he soon relieved their fears by laying down his gun and advancing towards them. The Indians were mounted on very fine horses, of which the Flatheads have a great abundance. That is, each man in the nation possesses from 20 to 100 head. Our guide could not speak the language of these people, but soon engaged them in conversation by signs or gesticulations the common language of all the Aborigines of North America. It is one understood by all of them, and appears to be sufficiently copious to convey with a degree of certainty the outlines of what they wish to communicate. After feeding and presenting the Flatheads with gifts, one of the young Flatheads agreed to act as the party's guide down the mountains through Flathead country. Once at the mouth of the Columbia River, Coulter was among a small group selected to venture to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. 
as well as explore the seacoast north of the Columbia into present-day Washington State. July 3, 1806. Coulter was one of the nine men who rode overland with Captain Merriweather Lewis, east from Traveler's Rest to the Missouri, and riding the mouth of the river to the mouth of the Yellowstone, where they hoped to meet up with Captain Clark's overland expedition. The trek took 40 days and considerable trouble after repeated tussles with the Minnetree Blackfoot Indians. On July 27th, Captain Lewis shot and killed a Blackfoot in the act of stealing a horse. The repercussions of this one act would echo through the years for Coulter and thousands more, as the Blackfeet would become fearsome foes to the whites in this part of the country. After traveling thousands of miles, Late in the summer, the expedition returned to the Mandan villages in present-day North Dakota, where they encountered Forrest Hancock and Joseph Dixon, two frontiersmen who were headed into the upper Missouri country in search of furs. On August 13, 1806, Lewis and Clark permitted Coulter to be honorably discharged almost two months early so that he could lead the two trappers back into the region they had explored. Sunday, 17th, August 1806, from the Journal of Sergeant Ordway. John Coulter asked leave of our officers to go back with Mr. Dixon to trap. So our officers settled with him and fitted him out with powder, lead, and a great number of articles which completed him for a trapping voyage of two years, which they were determined to stay until they make a fortune. Coulter, Mr. Dixon, and Hancock parted with us in their small canoe. Coulter, Hancock, and Dixon ventured into the wilderness with 20 beaver traps, a two-year supply of ammunition, and numerous other small tools gifted to them by the expedition, such as knives, rope, hatchets, and personal utensils. Although the exact route of the trapping party is not known, an account from Dixon puts the trappers on the Lower Missouri near the Three Forks region and a winter encampment in Clark's Fork Canyon. The Blackfeet controlled the territory surrounding the Three Forks, and for this reason, it is surmised that the three trappers were forced southward onto the Yellowstone River. The dangers of the narrow and rapid Yellowstone River and the absence of game may explain the quick disillusion of the party. Only two months after reaching the Upper Missouri, the trio split. Joseph Dixon recounts how Coulter had grown restless with taking shelter and ascended the canyon into the Sunlight Basin of present-day Wyoming. Coulter headed south, where he trapped and traded with the crows in the Shoshone in the early spring. In the early summer of 1807, two keelboats piloted by Manuel Liza spotted Coulter's canoe emerging from the mouth of the Platte River. As John Coulter and Manuel Liza traded information, Liza divulged his position as a co-founder of the Missouri Trading Company. With the news of the Louisiana Territory recently retrieved from Lewis and Clark's expedition, Lisa and his keelboats were part of an entrepreneurial pursuit to establish an outpost in the fur-rich land of the Upper Missouri. Several employees of Lisa's fur trading expedition included former members of the Lewis and Clark expedition, George Drew Yard, John Potts, and Peter Weiser. Pressing Coulter for his invaluable information regarding the territory, Lisa eventually persuaded Coulter to enter as an employee of the fur trading company and once again returned to the wilderness. Coulter helped build Fort Raymond, known also as Lisa's Fort, at the confluence of the Yellowstone and the Bighorn Rivers. In October of 1807, Lisa sent four men out in different directions to acquaint the area Indians with the news of his trading post. The young mountain man Edward Rose and the Lewis and Clark expedition veterans, Weiser, Drew Yard and John Coulter were chosen. He mainly traveled on snowshoes, carrying at least a 30 pound pack, plus his knife, tomahawk, and powder horn with a heavy rifle. Coulter followed the Pryor's Fork upstream into Wyoming, crossed south through the Pryor Mountains and cut west along the contemporary Shoshone River, but then referred to as Stinking Water River. During their wanderings, both Coulter and Drew York 
described geysers and bubbling springs populating the landscape just east of the Rocky Mountains. These accounts earned this area the tongue-in-cheek title, Coulter's Hell. Now, resources are scant regarding John Coulter's winter route of 1807 to 1808. Captain William Clark would record Coulter's route in his 1814 map of the West, but topographical errors delineated quite a bit from the real story of the landscape. So, from what historians can piece together, Coulter traveled south hugging the Absaroka mountain range and crossed the Continental Divide near Union Pass in the northern Wind River Range. Coulter then explored Jackson Hole and its valleys before crossing west into the Teton Basin. The only landmark Coulter left historians was discovered in 1933 by farmer William Beard when he accidentally uncovered a head-shaped stone with the words, John Coulter, 1808, carved into its flat surface. From the Teton Basin, he surmounted the Conant Pass and traveled north towards Yellowstone Lake. It was already early spring, and Coulter then proceeded back across the North Absaroka Mountains. Coulter arrived at Fort Raymond in March or April of 1808. Shortly after his return in the spring of 1808, Coulter ventured up the Yellowstone towards the Three Forks of the Missouri with a number of men to trap and further explore the region. At some point during the summer, the trappers came into contact with the local Indian tribes, and by the middle of the season, Coulter led a party of some 800 Crow and Flathead Indians back to Fort Raymond for the purposes of trading horses and furs. Along the return route, they were attacked by an estimated 1,500 Blackfeet. An acquaintance of John Coulter's, General Thomas James, wrote that Coulter was wounded in one leg by an arrow or bullet, we are not sure, but Coulter kept firing while sheltered in a brush thicket. The crows and the flatheads finally repulsed the Blackfeet, and Coulter returned to Fort Raymond to recover. He was there in July as Lisa packed the season's furs to deliver back to St. Louis, as well as witnessed and tried to prevent Edward Rose's assault upon their expedition's leader. A friend of Coulter's, John Potts, intervened, but received a severe beating for his effort. Both Potts and Coulter recovered from their respective wound by the spring of 1809, and the two men partnered to return to the Three Forks area and trap Beaver. Wary of the Blackfoot menace, they hid and slept all day, only to emerge and stake their traps after dark, retrieving them the following morning. It was on one of these mornings to empty their traps that they encountered a war party of Blackfeet. The British naturalist and traveler John Bradbury provided a later account from Coulter himself. They were examining their traps early one morning in a creek about six miles from the branch of the Missouri called Jefferson's Fork and were ascending in the canoe when they suddenly heard a great noise, resembling the trampling of animals. But they could not ascertain the fact, as the high perpendicular banks on each side of the river impeded their view. Coulter immediately pronounced it to be occasioned by Indians and advised an instant retreat. And a few minutes afterwards, their doubts were removed by a party of Indians making their appearance on both sides of the creek, to the amount of five or six hundred who beckoned them to come ashore. Coulter turned the head of the canoe to the shore, and at the moment of its touching, an Indian seized the rifle belonging to Potts. But Coulter, who is a remarkably strong man, immediately retook it and handed it to Potts, who remained in the canoe. And on the receiving of it, pushed off into the river. He had scarcely quitted the shore when an arrow was shot at him, and he cried out, Coulter, I'm wounded. Potts instantly leveled his rifle at an Indian and shot him dead on the spot. He was instantly pierced with arrows so numerous that to use the language of Coulter, he was made a riddle of. Now they seized Coulter, stripped him entirely naked, and began to consult on the manner in which he would be put to death. Coulter, who had been some time among the Kikatsa, or Crow Indians, had in a considerable degree acquired the Blackfoot language, and was also well acquainted with Indian customs. He cunningly commented that he was a very bad runner, although considered by hunters as remarkably swift. 
A chief led Coulter out on the prairie three or four hundred yards and released him. At that instant, the horrid war whoop sounded in the ears of poor Coulter, who, urged with the hope of preserving his life, ran with its speed which he himself was surprised. He proceeded towards Jefferson Fork, having to traverse a plain six miles in breadth, abounding with prickly pear, in which he was every instant treading on with his naked feet. He exerted himself to such a degree that blood gushed from his nostrils, and soon almost covered the floor of his body. He had now arrived within a mile of the river, when he distinctly heard the appalling sound of footsteps behind him, and every instant expected to feel the spear of his pursuer. Determined if possible to avoid the expected blow, he suddenly stopped, and turned round, and spread out his arms. The Indian, surprised by the suddenness of the action, and perhaps at the bloody appearance of Coulter, also attempted to stop. But exhausted with running, he fell whilst endeavoring to throw his spear, which stuck in the ground and broke in his hand. Coulter instantly snatched up the horny part, with which he pinned him to the earth, and continued his flight. Every moment of his time was improved by Coulter, who, although fainting and exhausted, succeeded in gaining the skirts of the cottonwood trees on the borders of the fork, through which he ran and plunged into the river. Fortunately for him, a little below this place was an island against the upper point of which a raft of drift timber had lodged. He dived under the raft, and after several efforts, got his head above water amongst the trunks of the trees, covered over with smaller wood to the depth of several feet. Scarcely had he secured himself when the Indians arrived on the river, screeching and yelling, as Coulter expressed it, like so many devils. In horrible suspense, he remained until night. When hearing no more of the Indians, he dived from under the raft and swam silently down the river to a considerable distance when he landed and traveled all night. Although happy in having escaped from the Indians, his situation was still dreadful. He was completely naked under the burning sun. The soles of his feet were entirely filled with thorns of the prickly pear. He was hungry and had no means of killing game. He arrived at the fort in seven days, having subsisted on a route known by naturalists as Sorelia at Scalunta. John Bradbury, 1817, travels in the interior of America in the years 1809, 1810, and 1811. In September 1809, Coulter paddled down the Missouri to the Mandan villages on the Knife River, when George Druyard arrived with Pierre Chateau's party, which had successfully escorted Chief Sheheke and his family back to their home after their visit with President Jefferson. While the Mandan celebrated Sheheke's safe return, Coulter told Druyard of his experience with the Blackfeet warriors, including Pot's death and his own escape. At the Hidatsa village in October of 1809, Coulter encountered another party of trappers from the Missouri Fur Trading Company and for the third time in four years was invited back up the Yellowstone. This took considerable coaxing from Manueliza's partner, Pierre Menard, but he eventually persuaded Coulter to return with him to the Three Forks in order to erect a new trading post. After wintering at Fort Raymond, the company built the fort on the Three Forks in short order, finishing in April. However, the Blackfeet harassed the trappers at every opportunity, <laughs> making excursions from the fort life-threatening. Coulter was away at his own traps when the Blackfeet Indians killed two trappers and captured three others that month. Returning to find his dead companions, he rushed to the fort in order to learn what had happened. The story relayed, Coulter swore, quote, If God would only forgive me this time and let me off, I will leave the country the day after tomorrow, and be damned if I ever come into it again. True to his word, after a continuous six years in the wilderness, John Coulter left Fort Raymond in July of 1810 and had returned to St. Louis within six weeks. Back in the relatively civilized environment of St. Louis, Coulter consulted his former commander, Captain William Clark, and provided additional information concerning his winter of 1806 to 1807 meandering in the Rocky Mountains. Clark incorporated the descriptions with some topographical delineation in his 1814 map, 
It was published in 1814 with Biddle's edition of both Captain Lewis's and Clark's journals. Sometime within a year of his return to St. Louis, Coulter married a woman known only as Sarah, or Sally, who bore him a son named Hiram. The Coulters settled in La Charette, some 30 miles up the Missouri from St. Charles, where the elderly Daniel Boone was one of their neighbors. Thomas James went so far as to compare Coulter to the now mythical backwoodsman. Quote, he wore an open, ingenious, and pleasing countenance of the Daniel Boone stamp. Nature had formed in him, like Boone, for hardy endurance of fatigue, privations, and perils. Within his own lifetime, Coulter had become a local folk hero. When the United States declared war on Great Britain in 1812, Nathan Boone, son of Daniel Boone, mustered a mobile frontier militia force of hardy woodsmen named the Mountain Rangers. Coulter volunteered for service with Nathan in March, without firing a shot in the war. The illustrious and grizzled Coulter died of jaundice on May 7th. Thank you.